Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 14th of November, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information. You can always do that by giving us a call at 1-800-472-0391. Find us online at weather.gov slash Alaska, and if you can't find what you want or just can't look at the right spot and need some more information, feel free to send me an email anytime. I'm happy to reply as I'm able. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is how you reach me online. Hazardous weather tonight is really still focused up in northwestern Alaska. We have winter storm warnings, winter weather advisories, and one high wind warning for the Bering Strait communities there around St. Lawrence Island and the western end of the Seward Peninsula. Uh, for gusts there out of the south, up to 65 miles per hour, that warning will go until 6 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Winter storm warnings up around the Chukchi Coast and also the western end of the Brooks Range there. We're talking about four to eight inches in general for many locations there. That should last through the day on Wednesday until about six o'clock or so. You're also going to find some stronger gusts there up uh, to about 35 miles per hour with winds out of the south. Now for the Baldwin and Selawick uh, uh, Peninsula areas, we're expecting gusts up to 35 miles per hour, but a little more snow, probably talking about six to eight inches of snow. And for the Kobuk and No Attack Valleys, both the upper and lower ends, anywhere from four to seven to about four to eight inches and as much as 10 in some cases. So it uh, looks like uh, warnings there for you as well. And as you get up toward Ambler there, uh, winter weather advisory, uh, we're expecting again uh, at least some snow to last into uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday evening. So a lot going on across the entire region, uh, snow and wind and sometimes just wind if you're in the Bering Strait communities. Let's get to the maps. Here's a look at the satellite picture and you can see one area of low pressure exiting the Gulf. It is uh, trying very hard to stick around in the Pacific Northwest, still sloshing up clouds into the southern parts of Southeast, and it's still creating quite a pressure gradient that's drawing a lot of wind through southeastern Alaska. But by and large, this system is done. It just, it just won't leave. Kind of like folks at Thanksgiving, right? They just, would you leave now? Dinner's over. Out across the West, low pressure's out across the Gulf of Anadir. And you can see a large frontal structure here all the way across the Bering Sea and a healthy southerly flow that's working up from this uh, North Pacific all the way up the West Coast. And that's what's creating that very strong flow of southerly winds across the Bering Strait and probably some pretty strong gusts up across northwestern Alaska as well. When you couple that with snow, that's going to mean poor visibility at times and it's going to be a little tricky to navigate. So be careful out there. Make sure you've got a plan before you go and make sure someone's expecting you and lets other people know if, if you're not making it there on time. And then for you, be on time. Low pressure out across the eastern parts of Russia, 989 millibars. It's a healthy low already, and it's bringing in some warm and wet air. It's raining, and uh, 35 degrees around St. Lawrence Island and near Savunga this afternoon. So um, it, it's healthily warm there, not a whole lot of sea ice around just yet. Snow showers out across the Kotzebue Sound and Norton Sound regions in the Yukon Delta, as well as the Chukchi Sea Coast up around Point Hope. And then to the east, dry conditions, high pressure sitting up across northern parts of Alaska, 1,039 millibars, and that's pushing a lot of air into that low pressure system across the Pacific Northwest at 991 millibars. That pressure gradient is what's giving you all the winds and breezes across southeast today. Otherwise, fairly dry conditions for many across the interior and southwestern Alaska tonight. For southeast, might be some areas of blowing snow if you've got snow on the ground. Out across the west, and included fronts working into Norton Sound and Kotzebue Sound and the Selawik Valley. Uh, watch for periods of rain and maybe even freezing rain. That's not the kind of news you want to hear there, but that's how things look right now. Uh, periods of snow across north and western Alaska into the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys. And then another surge of colder air building in across the eastern end of Asia behind what we have now. A wave of low pressure is leaving the eastern Aleutians. That's brought a little bit of fog to Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. As we get into Wednesday, the front is still creeping east. Remember, this is a big area of high pressure across western Canada now, 1,025 millibars. It's still making breezes through southeast, uh, not quite as strong as a wind through Juneau as it was today. But the front is pushing into that, and so we know this is a healthy weather system already. 
Behind that, uh, rain uh, changing over to freezing rain as that gets into some of the colder air and snow continuing to spread eastward along the Brooks Range and working its way toward the Tanana Valley. Not quite into Fairbanks just yet, but it'll get there. South Central, more clouds than anything else and high pressure moving into the central chain at 1,041 millibars. By Friday, we've got low moving across South Central. It probably means some snow showers around the Kenai Peninsula and the Anchorage region. Uh, as early as Wednesday afternoon and evening, and then spreading eastward with accumulating snows into the central and eastern interior and the northwestern parts of Alaska still seeing snow. And look at the pressure gradient tightening up here. There may still be some areas of freezing rain for Nunavak Island and parts of the Yukon Delta and the Norton Sound. But uh, it'll start to change over to more of a snowy situation as the low moves through the heart of Alaska. At high pressure, back to the west, 1,044 millibars. That is becoming a strong system, and that will start to make more wind for southwestern Alaska and will help to strengthen this weather system as we get into the weekend. So this is not done with Alaska just yet, not for southeast, not for south central, and not for the interior. Stay tuned for more weather information as we get into Thursday, Friday, and Saturday for sure. Let's take a quick check of your temperatures now. As we get into Wednesday morning, teens and 20s for southeast. South central looking at teens and 20s as well. 32 in Kodiak. Fairbanks down to 5 below. Fort Yukon 13 below. The North Slope anywhere from 5 below to about 5 above. Kotzebue Sound in the teens and 20s. Most of southwest in the 20s and 30s and the Alaska Peninsula. And the Provolone is pretty close to 40 degrees. High temperatures on Wednesday. Cold stuff anywhere from 8 to Fairbanks to about 1 below in Eagle and Northway. Southeast, you'll see highs in the 20s and 30s, nearing oh, 40 degrees for Ketchikan, Craig, and Klawak. Southwest, Bristol Bay temps in the uh, near 30 to about 40 degree range if you look out at Nunavak Island. St. Lawrence Island, also well above freezing. Kotzebue Sound in the 20s and 30s, Barrow at 18. As you look at Thursday morning, teens and 20s again for southeast uh, in the middle and upper end of the Tanana Valley. You're looking at anywhere from 5 below to 5 above. Uh, looks like teens for most of the North Slope, 20s for Norton Sound and Kotzebue Sound, almost 30 in Nome, in fact, and mid-20s for Bristol Bay, 33 in Kodiak, and teens for Kenai Peninsula and South Central. High temperatures on Thursday afternoon, still below freezing, well below for Fort Yukon, Eagle, and Northway, about 11 for uh, Fairbanks. Uh, very close to freezing for Nome and Norton Sound and Unalakleet, 20s and 30s for Northwest, uh, mid teens or so for the North Slope. South Central, we'll see highs back in the mid-20s to about 30, near 40 in Kodiak, on Alaska and Dutch Harbor, 43, and 20s and 30s for a large part of Southeast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to flying weather now. IFR conditions will be uh, present as we get into Wednesday morning, all the way from the Chukchi Coast through Kotzebue Sound, the Seward Peninsula, and the Yukon Delta over St. Lawrence Island and Nunavak Island, and on the outside edge of Bristol Bay and into the Alaska Peninsula. Watch for MVFR to flirt with the southern outer coast of southeast, but most of south central Kodiak Island and the interior, with the exception of the Central and eastern Beaufort Sea Coast will have generally VFR conditions there for Wednesday morning. By the afternoon, you can see the next wave of weather moving ashore into the YK Delta, uh, into the interior of the Koyukuk Valley and the lower Yukon Valley, all the way up to the western Brooks Range and uh, the Chukchi Coast. Conditions continue to improve away from the southern outer coast of southeastern Alaska, and MVFR spreads a little bit further into the central and eastern part of the chain. Uh, by Thursday afternoon, IFR conditions are fairly widespread across the interior and across some parts of south central, including the Kenai Peninsula and the Anchorage Bowl and into the Susitna and Matanuska Valleys, west all the way to the lower Yukon and the Yukon Delta and some parts of the Kotzebue Sound region as well as the Chukchi Coast. MVFR is fairly widespread also across most of the interior and the Bering Strait Coast, with southeast still in the clear. For Thursday afternoon, conditions continue to spread eastward, showing lowered visibility and ceilings for parts of the northern Gulf Coast with MVFR out to sea. IFR conditions across the interior and through uh, areas in some of the northern passes of the uh, south central region and uh, also looking through the uh, middle Tanana Valley, uh, the Beaufort Sea Coast, and Chukchi Coast, and into the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, also parts of Bristol Bay. Let's look at your pass conditions. Individually for Wednesday, we expect Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass to start at VFR conditions but lean over toward MVFR as the day goes on. Fairly widespread shield of MVFR moving in from the west. As we get to Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, similar conditions there for our western Alaska range passes. VFR conditions should start your day and you should have a pretty good shot as far as that goes. But once we get a little bit further eastward, uh, Rainy Pass still looking at MVFR by the afternoon. Everything east of Windy Pass all the way toward Isabel 
Pass, uh, also Mentasta and Tanita Pass. We expect to see VFR conditions all the way through some of our eastern passes through Wednesday. So things look pretty good there. That includes Portage Pass and also Chilkoot and White Pass, as you saw on the charts just a few moments ago. Let's take a look at the freezing levels. Uh, the big change that's coming is a strong push of southerlies out ahead of this next wave, which you can see moving off of the eastern um, parts of Russia and, uh, and Asia. Uh, the elevated warming levels are anywhere from two, four, six to 8,000 feet across Bristol Bay as we start up our morning. And then further east, you can still see some of the cold air draining out of the southern parts of southeast. Those levels there are around 2,000 feet. Most of the interior, the north slope, south central, and southeast will be below freezing in the morning. But uh, for many in the west, that warm-up will be fairly significant there. So the icing threat is generally limited to uh, levels that are fairly high up there, above 6,000 feet for the Bering Strait communities, below 3,000 feet for areas generally east and north of Arctic Village and Fort Yukon. South of that, we get into some warmer air again, above 10,000 feet for Bristol Bay and into some of the Alaska Range passes. Southeast, not a considerable threat for your daytime tomorrow. And the next wave, again, producing some additional icing concerns way out to the west, perhaps including Shemi as we start up your Wednesday. Let's take a look at the jet stream. We have one wave of low pressure that is dropping to the south and east, a large pronounced trough with that uh, southwesterly flow reaching into the west coast of the lower 48 at 110 knots. A ridge of high pressure currently moving over mainland Alaska. The wind speeds on the east side of that are between 95 and 110 knots from the north and west. And then there's that warming flow that's driving those freezing levels up, 50 to 60 knots there on that southerly wind. And then a broad west to northwesterly flow dropping back into the Bering Strait. Again, that is the next wave of weather that's trying to move through as we head into the mid to latter part of the week. At 9,000 feet, uh, you can see that northwesterly flow wrapping into low pressure just south and east of Haida Gwaii. Wind speeds over southeast around 30 to 40 knots. We have west and southwesterlies moving into the interior between 20 and 30. And north and westerly winds coming in around 30 to 50 knots, reaching the west coast. Bristol Bay, 25 to 45 there. A little bit lower, the wind speeds are fairly in the same, or the wind is in the same direction. The wind speeds are off just a little bit, though. You're looking at 10 to 20 knots across many parts of the interior. A northerly flow coming into that low pressure system near Haida Gwaii, 15 to 25 in most regions. And a westerly flow continues across the bearing, anywhere from 40 to 50 knots at times. North slope, you're looking at about 10 knots from the south and southeast. Turbulence potential then is really going to focus on Kotzebue Sound, the Noatak Valley, the interior of the Seward Peninsula, and Shishrep, St. Lawrence Island, and many across the uh, eastern chain to the Alaska Peninsula and perhaps closer to Yakutat, below about three to 4,000 feet. The interior and south central and most of southeast look pretty good. Back with your marine weather here in just a minute. In Valdez, all the waves were locally generated. Tremendous land movement during the quake initially caused the water to literally stand up and collapse into town. Then, 93 million cubic yards of glacial deposits under the dock area slumped and generated a 30 to 40 foot wave. Freddy Christofferson, then 13, described what he saw. Dan and I went down on the dock to see the boat and load and then we were leaving. The earthquake started and then Danny and I ran. I looked back and I saw the boat go up. Then it took off and then I saw the dock go up. And then we kept running up to Stiff Waters. I got a ride to um, some guy in a pen. We went out to Six Mile Hill. Then we waited for a while. Then we went back in. Four decades later, that memory remains burned into Fred Christofferson's soul. It was the, the biggest, blackest wave that I had ever seen. I was turning around watching it uh, with my little buddies hollering at me up the road here, run, run, don't look, run. I looked back and I saw the ship. It was about 30 feet out of the water and the stern was, was in the air and the bow was, was pointing right down into the water and, uh, and I could see the prop slowly turning and water coming off of it. 
great big crevasse opened up and I didn't know if I was going to make it. The longshoremen and the, and the visitors that were on the dock running this way, trying to get to the shore, and it broke away from the shore, and they ran this way to go to the boat to look for some protection, and there, there just wasn't any protection. They just, uh, finally the dock all busted up, and they all disappeared, never to be seen again. They were gone in just a moment. I just couldn't imagine the people that were on the dock and what they, what they, the last minutes of their lives and how they must, must have suffered uh, knowing what was going to happen. A short time later, at the far end of Port Valdez, the Chute Bay glacial moraine above and below the waterline avalanched and collapsed into the bay. It generated a 220-foot wave. It was the tallest wave recorded anywhere during the 64 quake. Delbert Ferrier and his father were in a skiff a short distance away when the monster passed by. That's when I saw it wipe out, take all the concrete off the light, wipe that out, and go over the top of that little island and go in front of us, and it was starting to break on top. So, but we were just getting the big rollers. We were going up and down, you know, not knowing which, what the hell was gonna happen. And that just missed us. We got more of the roller part. Had we been back there, well, we, you know, it'd be gone. By the time this wave reached Valdez, it was still 40 feet high, but it did the greatest damage to the town. In the years following the disaster, Valdez was rebuilt on more solid ground about three miles away. Tsunamis are created by the sudden displacement of water, usually caused by very powerful earthquakes that violently change the elevation of the seafloor. Tsunamis also can be caused by above or underwater landslides, which are often generated by earthquakes. Though far less likely, tsunamis may also be caused by the eruption of submarine volcanoes, meteor impacts, or nuclear explosions. When a tsunami is generated in the open ocean, the water is so deep that the wave is barely detectable, maybe no more than a foot high at the surface but it can travel across the ocean at jetliner speeds of 500 to 600 miles per hour. As that same wave reaches shallower water, it will slow down to about a tenth of the speed and may grow more than 10 times in height. If the lower part of the wave reaches shore first, the incoming surge may actually be preceded by water flowing out to sea, exposing the ocean bottom or emptying channels and even huge bays. Most think that a tsunami appears as an enormous cresting wave, but in fact, most tsunamis come in as a fast-moving surge of water, like a monster high tide in fast motion. In addition to the 1964 tsunamis, two other tsunami events in Alaska stand out. In 1958, the highest tsunami recorded in modern history occurred in Latuya Bay in southeast Alaska. An earthquake dislodged a huge chunk of a mountain which crashed into the bay. The impact created a wave that splashed 1,700 feet up a mountainside, completely denuding a slope of all trees and soil. One fisherman was killed when the wave swept his boat out to sea. In 1946, a strong earthquake in the Aleutian Islands that probably generated an underwater landslide created a huge tsunami that wiped out the scotch cap lighthouse perched 40 feet above sea level. Five people were killed. This same wave traveled silently and undetected across the Pacific Ocean to the Hawaiian Islands, where it killed another 159 unsuspecting people. It was this disaster that led to the formation of the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. The U.S. National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program uh, is the educational program in which communities are advised uh, that they, in fact, 
live in an area uh, in which tsunamis might be expected sometime in the future uh, to attack and to educate the population that, in fact, there may not be much warning time. And this particular program is a partnership between three agencies, the U.S. Geological Survey, seismologist uh, expertise, NOAA, which is oceanographic expertise, and FEMA, which is mitigation expertise. So those are the three partners that are working on the federal side. On the state side is the five states affected. That's uh, Alaska and Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, and California. Here at the UEF, at the Geophysical Institute, we are involved in three of the aspects of, of this national program. It, those consist of warning, um, risk assessment, and risk mitigation. The warning aspect that we participate in it uses seismology. At the Geophysical Institute, scientists monitor earthquake data from several hundred seismic sensing stations across Alaska. When a seismic disturbance occurs, this data is instantly transmitted to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer, Alaska. Scientists on 24-hour call quickly analyze that data, along with data from their own network of sensors, and decide whether or not they should issue a tsunami warning. When we see a large earthquake has occurred and it's occurred near the coast, we'll issue a warning to those who could be affected by the wave within a certain amount of time. And then we'll monitor the wave to see if it really was dangerous or not. And if it was dangerous, then we'll expand the warning to, in, to, uh, to all the people that it may be dangerous for. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Time for a quick check of your sea ice edge. You can see the Beaufort sea ice has really filled in here all the way east of Barrow. There's at least some uh, uh, higher than 80% uh, concentration there all the way out toward demarcation point. And the rest of that offshore has filled in as well. We're still missing quite a bit of the Chukchi Sea ice, but we're also getting some younger ice pushing upwards into parts of Kotzebue Sound and Norton Sound and a little bit of coastal freezing there uh, south of Macoria. So watch for changes there, but right now a strong southerly wind is blowing. We'll check that here on the western marine maps in just a moment. In the meantime, breezy conditions continue for south and east. The pressure gradient will still be somewhat strong tomorrow. Not as strong as it has been today, but if you're around Haines and Skagway, you're going to have more wind. 45 knots out of the north with 12-foot uh, seas there. Stevens Passage still looking at a northerly flow up to 40 knots, 11-foot seas there, and gusts to 35 knots as you get into Clarence Strait with 4-foot seas heading out into the Dixon entrance and an offshore flow all the way up to Yakutat with 20 to 30 knots or so, even 35 knots out across Sound, 7-foot seas there for many areas along the outer coast as well. Conditions should improve even more as we get into Thursday. You're still looking at a northerly breezy flow through Stevens Passage and Lynn Canal, 5 to 6-foot seas there, and looking at gusts up to 40 knots around Juneau and Stevens Passage. Uh, lighter winds around Clarence Strait and light and somewhat variable offshore winds as well. You can still see that offshore flow though is starting to push back in as low pressure is forming off to your west. For Wednesday, generally light winds 15 to 20, 25 in a few areas there. Actually gusts out of the Copper River Basin up to 40 knots with 5 foot seas. Otherwise a northwesterly flow in small seas inside of Prince William Sound and most of Cook Inlet looking at a light northeasterly flow 10 to 15 with 3 to 4 foot seas. Thursday, look for light northwesterlies inside of Prince William Sound. Northerlies across the northern Gulf, 15 to 20, and then a little bit more of a stronger breeze moving across the Barren Islands, 30 to 35 knots with 9 to 10 foot seas on Thursday. Inside of Bristol Bay, northwesterlies, 25 knots with a 3 foot sea. Northeasterlies inside of Shellacoff Strait with a 2 foot sea. And west and northwesterly flow strengthening across the northwestern Gulf and down the Alaska Peninsula on the Pacific Coast, 7-foot seas there, 30 knots on the other side, also looking at 7-foot seas on Wednesday. For Bristol Bay on Thursday, a stronger westerly push. This is on the eastern side of um, the high pressure and low pressures moving through the interior, and that's drawing a lot of wind here. So we're going to have some stronger gusts in the region. Look for 12 to as strong as 17-foot seas there on Thursday. The Pacific Coast, 12-foot seas, and 9 to uh, maybe as small as 7-foot seas inside of Shelikov Strait with 30 to 35 knot winds on either side of Kodiak Island. For the chain, west and southwesterly winds, 10 to 11-foot seas there, 20 to 30 knots out in the west for the central and eastern chain. A little bit more of a curve there from the west and northwest, 20 to 30 knots with 8 to 9-foot seas in the region. 
As we get back into Thursday, a little bit more of a southerly flow in the west, and we're still in that west and northwesterly component for Thursday. The strongest winds and highest seas just a little bit more to the north and east. So you're just kind of getting the glancing blow here on Thursday. For Wednesday in the west coast, uh, we're looking at that west and southwesterly onshore flow, southerlies in Norton Sound, westerlies in the Kuskokwim Delta, and for the St. Paul and St. George area, 25 knots with 9-foot seas there, 16-foot seas around St. Matthew, and 10-foot seas around St. Lawrence Island. You can see the seas are picking up even more east of the Pribilovs, down toward the Alaska Peninsula, 17-foot seas in the Delta, 14-foot seas around the Pribilovs, and 18 to 19-foot seas north of Nunavak Island and westward St. Matthew, 16-foot seas south of St. Lawrence Island, and 5-foot seas in Norton Sound. For Wednesday, look for an offshore flow for the northwest coast, 20 to 30 knots. You're expecting 7 to 9-foot seas. Over the ice, 15 to 20, and then Barrow and West, 6-foot seas on a 25-knot wind from the east. On Thursday, winds still holding at 25 knots from the east for the Beaufort Sea coast. An east and southeasterly flow for the Chukchi Sea, but look at this, a northwesterly push coming into Kotzebue Sound as well as areas through the Bering Strait, 25 to 35, with 6 to as high as 16 feet there on Thursday. That is a look at your marine forecast. Let's re recap the weather one more time. Winter storm warnings as well as winter weather advisories for many up and down the west coast, the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, uh, Selawik uh, uh, Valley, as well as uh, areas up across the north and west. Uh, the Brooks Range and the Chukchi Coast and the Bering Strait communities, wind and snow are your primary issues. A uh, high wind warning continues for gusts out of the south up to 65 miles per hour. For St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait, uh, wind and snow will be a problem for the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys. Uh, as much as 7 to 10 inches of snow, in most cases about 4 to 8 there as this wave of weather is moving in from the Bering. Across southeast, winds will stay up as we saw in your marine forecast just a few minutes ago. And as this weather maker marches eastward, it's going to spread more snow across the interior as we get into Thursday and Friday. Wednesday night and Thursday may bring some light snow across parts of south central. And periods of rain and freezing rain may also accompany the weather that you experience in the Yukon and Kuskokwim Delta with high pressure anchoring in across the central Aleutians. That's a look at your Alaska weather. Thanks for watching. See you right here again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.